Hi, everybody. It's Bill, and I'm here today with my fellow geezer, Scott, uh, who's uh, looking at this opportunity to talk about a 50th uh, anniversary. Uh, we've had a, a whole spate of them, uh, and this is another interesting one, a, a very uh, 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 interesting, uh, particularly because uh, Scott's a big fan of this band, and it's uh, Genesis, uh, and Genesis is perhaps their magnum opus i don't know uh, scott will certainly talk about where this one fits it's foxtrot it came out in 1972 and it is uh certainly kind of a uh, uh a groundbreaking one as far as the band is concerned in terms of uh you know their classic lineup uh starting to really hit on all cylinders and really finding their way in the the kind of uh early 70s prog rock space, which they start to uh, really dominate uh, going from this album on. So I, I think uh, I've listened to this. It's a very uh, interesting album. Prague is not my uh, my real you know headspace, but uh, I do find these sounds intriguing. And I want uh, to ask Scott uh, if he wouldn't mind uh, telling us a little bit about the background of the record and uh, and where it fits in the discography of Genesis. Thanks, Bill. Uh, yeah, Foxtrot. This is this is really the first album that uh, uh, where Ge where Genesis made any noise. Uh, it is their fourth album in their discography. Uh, it didn't make a whole lot of noise. It was pretty quiet in the United States, but but it uh, it it broke them commercially in the United Kingdom, which is their home. It's the second album by the uh, the classic five man lineup. That's uh, Peter Gabriel, Phil Collins, Steve Hackett, Michael Rutherford, and Tony Banks. <clears throat> they went on to do uh, two more studio albums after this, uh, and that that's pretty much considered the classic five man lineup at Genesis. You know, then there was a later classic three man lineup, but this was the classic five man lineup. This is the first album that uh, charted for them in the UK. Uh, it never charted in the US. People in the US didn't hear, start hearing this until a couple of years later when they started getting on to Genesis with some of their later albums. Uh, it's the second album by the classic lineup. Uh, it's it, and it's really like Bill said. It's it's the one where they really started hitting on all cylinders. <clears throat> it's it's not their magnum opus. Their magnum opus was the uh, last one that these uh, that these five did a couple years later, which is a double album, the concept album, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. <clears throat> but this is uh, I don't know what is, what is the next level down, Bill, from a magnum opus. What, I, 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 <laughs> what would be the term for that? <laughs> you call it, you call it like a, uh, a flawed masterpiece, but I'm not sure that that, that fits either because it seems closer to a masterpiece in quotes than than anything else. I mean, yeah, it, yeah, it, it, yeah, it is it is a masterpiece, but is it's but uh, anyway, but that, you know, let's let's not go into that rabbit hole of. Uh, of semantics, right? Uh, this was this was a, a a landmark album, both in their career and in the uh, uh, Annals of Prague. This is one of the. Uh, there are basically two uh, big uh, epic songs that came out of the early seventies out of England and Prague rock, and one of them was "Close to the Edge," which uh, which landed. Uh, well, actually, this actually close to the edge landed uh, a little bit later than this one. This one uh, it was about the same time. This one, side two of uh, Foxtrot, is most well known for the uh, uh, the song "Supper's Ready," the twenty three minute uh, opus from Genesis. Their their only really attempt ever at sort of a side long epic, uh, and it was an attempt that worked very well. Um, this uh, mostly what happened here uh why this became so noticed was this was uh this was the uh album that uh that inspired uh, peter gabriel to become uh sort of this theatrical front man instead of a guy who just stood in front of the uh in, in front of the stage and, and sang uh <clears throat> you notice the artwork on this album with the uh, uh with the iconic character on the front uh the, the the fox wearing the red dress 
Um, again, like I said, in Genesis 4th album, I still haven't been able to uh, make a dent in the uh, in, in the charts. They haven't done well commercially, and they're they're broke, and they're they're trying to figure out what the hell to do to get themselves noticed. I can't figure out. Well, somebody came up with the idea, uh, uh, the producer of the record, or somebody came up with the idea, well, let's have somebody uh, uh, stand in front of the concert hall when uh, you know when Genesis was doing a concert one night. Let's have somebody stand in front of the concert hall dressed up like this character wearing a red dress and a fox's head and just, you know, just flag people down, just create some attention out in the streets. And now it kicked around. Nobody thought, yeah, yeah, nobody thought, thought it would be a good idea. It would work or anything like that. But Peter Gabriel, who at the time was, uh, he was still just 22 years old, and he's still trying to figure out what he is and where he's going. Well, he thought, well, why don't I do that? And he gave it some thought, and he didn't tell anybody, but he went home, and he had just, he, he just got married to his first wife, Jill. He started going through her closet and found this long red dress in her closet. He grabbed it. He went down the street to this uh, uh, costume shop and uh, and bought this fox head. And he took the he took this uh, wardrobe with him. He stuffed it in. He didn't tell anybody. They were in uh, Dublin doing a place in a, in a little boxing ring in Dublin. <clears throat> and they were playing the song the musical box which came from their previous album uh called nursery crime it, it was it was their uh, uh their, their favorite song at the time and then uh in the middle of uh, uh of the musical box when there's this long instrumental passage during a transition part of it gabriel disappeared from stage and then he came back out on stage wearing this red dress and his fox's head and everybody just gasped and what the heck is this? Even his bandmates, he didn't tell his bandmates. He didn't tell anybody, he just did it because he was afraid that somebody would tell him, no, don't do it. <laughs> so, so he just went ahead and did it. And, um, and well, what happened was uh, somebody was actually there with uh, 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 taking a film of it. It's not a video camera, it wasn't a phone. I mean, if somebody was there, uh, doing a uh, doing a film of it and uh the the big uh trade industry publication in england at the time melody maker uh got a hold of a picture of this and put it on their front page and wrote a story about it and thus genesis uh genesis be got into the mainstream consciousness because of that, <laughs> because of this outrageous thing that Peter Gabriel did, and that, of course, then led for the rest of his time with Genesis. I mean, that was that was a big thing. That's what everybody knew from Genesis from then on was that they had this lead singer who always showed up in these weird costumes all the time. Well, that's where that started. That started here, and that helped uh, Foxtrot sell some records, and it was their first charting album, uh, and. And the rest is history for that band, right? Uh, <clears throat> musically, though, this this was uh, um, I listen to it now, and it a lot of this stuff sounds pretty dated, but but for the time, I mean, this was this was a pretty groundbreaking album. This was uh, there wasn't a whole lot else going on that sounded like this. Uh, it was it was much less complex and. Uh, uh, and kind of, I don't want to say convoluted, but 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 yes, was really the 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 band that really brought uh, prog rock into the mainstream back then. Uh, this was a lot less complex than what Yes was doing. Uh, it was a little more fantastical, a little a little uh, uh, more of a sense of humor about it, uh, and just just more light subject matter, not as not as heavy and and and. And, and as serious as yes was but these are kind of the two heads of the uh of, of the of the prog rock monster that was emerging out of uh england at the time uh whereas, whereas yes made their big splash in the u.s by this time it still took a couple more years for genesis to do so uh they showed up on uh midnight special one friday night uh during the uh, uh tour for this album and uh 
and performed Watcher of the Skies and then also the, uh, the musical box uh, from the previous album. <laughs> And soil. Now the rain has come to end. His life again destroyed life. Do they play elsewhere? Do they know more than their child again? But nobody, nobody paid too much attention to them uh, in the United States. So it took a while before they would get here. Um, musically, I, I, I consider this a five-star album. Now that, uh, now that we've all gone back, uh, me as, as well as everybody else in the United States, a couple of years after the fact on this album, uh, went back and started uh, paying attention to this retroactively it uh it it became uh it became a pretty indelible record out from its time uh, side one are four shorter songs uh a couple of them are considered genesis classics watcher of the skies which opens the album uh which is uh a story that was based on a uh arthur c clock arthur c clark story that, uh, uh, that that Gabriel had read, and it's uh, it's it's a story about this overlord just you know looking over, uh, keeping his eye on the planet Earth and making sure that uh, everything goes the way that he wants it to go. Um, the second tune, timetable, is just a nice, sweet little uh, uh, song based on uh, Tony Banks's keyboards, and uh, and it's and it's a great. It's a great uh, uh, showcase for uh, for Peter Gabriel's sort of uh, softer, more melodic uh, style of singing. <clears throat> Get Him Out by Friday is a classic Genesis song. Uh, it's it's a, a very it, it's a very humorous song about how. Uh, how these landlords are trying to figure out a way to get uh, to get the most out of their out of the limited space they have, so they uh, so they decide to to undertake these uh, genetic engineering experiment, uh, experiments and make people shorter so they can cram more people into their uh, into their tenement houses, right? <clears throat> and it's a conversation about that. The last song on side one is a filler. Every time I think of Foxtrot and I try to remember what the closing song is on side one i can never remember what it is and i have to go look it up it's uh called uh can utility and the co and and the uh coastliners it's a forgettable song i, I never remember this song <laughs> so that i've been listening to this album i never remember that one but side two is the uh showcase for this album it opens with a little uh one and a half minute uh uh, acoustic guitar solo by Steve Hackett, who was still fairly new to the band and trying to fight in his way in the band. And he offered this piece up and they all loved it. And he was surprised as anybody that they uh, opened side two with this little thing. And it serves as a great introduction to the uh, magnum opus of this album, which was Supper's Ready. Classic 23 minute uh, early prog rock epic which I still don't know to this day. I can't tell you what the narrative uh, of this song is, but it just has this, it, it, it's all over the place in styles. There are some quiet moments. There, uh, there are some nice moments where uh, Gabriel shines with his vocals. Uh, each, each of the uh, members of this band have their little, little turn in this, in this, uh, in this song. It goes through some some quiet passages, some some fast passages, some good rock and roll, some uh, some nice little jazz music, some some keyboard work by Tony Banks. Uh, 
and it's it's all quite quite quaint now it, it it's it's nice i mean back in the day it was that was really good stuff but it, it's all pretty quaint now but then you get to the last half of the song, the last two sections of the song, it becomes probably what is the best piece of music that uh, Genesis ever did in, in, in their entire history. Uh, Tony Banks would agree with me on that. I've heard him say that. Michael Rutherford, uh, I've heard him say that. But uh, but the Apocalypse in 9-8 section and uh as sure as eggs is eggs, which are the last two sections of the supper's ready, are, are some of the most some of the most powerful uh, things that ever came out of a prog rock album. The stuff is just magnificent. Uh, anyone who ever who just remembers Phil Collins as a as a singer as a frontman of the '80s version of Genesis, uh, <clears throat> if 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 you need any. Uh, uh, any proof that uh, Phil Collins was a hell of a drummer <laughs> in his day. Uh, listen to the last 10 minutes of this song, Supper's Ready, and just pay attention to what Phil Collins is doing on the drums. And it's just remarkable. I don't know if I've ever heard a drummer do anything as, as good as this ever. Uh, it's a very complicated uh, time signature, as the title suggests, Apocalypse in 9-8. And it's, it's sort of this marching of offbeat uh, a driving uh, song and Collins just, it, it's remarkable how Collins just holds us all together. Yeah, if, 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 if you want to hear what Phil Collins can do that has anything to do with not being a singer, what Phil, Phil Collins can do as a drummer, listen to this. I don't know if anybody has ever done any, any more remarkable than this on a, on a rock album ever. Uh, you know, people, I, I, I think coming out of that uh, early prog era, uh, most people think of Bill Bruford when you talk about... Uh, uh, you know, top-notch uh, prog rock drummers. I'm telling you, uh, Collins, at, at least in this section, Collins Collins puts in, uh, it gives us something just as good as anything that Bill Bruford ever did. Uh, listen to that stuff. But it's uh, it's just a remarkable album. It, it's a great, a great nugget of its time, especially uh, the last last uh the last half of supper's ready is certainly worth the, the 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 price of admission for this record uh and it it really uh it really was a harbinger of things to come for genesis it was after this it was the following album which was uh uh selling england by the pound is 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 where they finally did uh make their mark in the United States. And then of course, then fall after that was uh Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, which they made a big splash, especially with their stage show on that one in 1975. But uh but this was uh this was this was Genesis at pretty much at the start of the start of its peak. Uh you know, Genesis is, you know, they're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh and they're remembered both as a as a uh uh, influential prog band from the 70s and a and a big influ influential pop band from the following decades in the 80s uh and this is this is pretty much where it all started here this is their fourth album the first three were just kind of warm-ups and building up to this uh definitely uh highly recommended well, uh, the one question I was going to ask you, Scott, is uh, you had alluded to the fact that uh, you kind of retrospectively listened to this. Uh, when did you actually start to get into Genesis? Well, I, yeah, I uh, uh, I first I first heard it. I first heard of Genesis. I knew Firth of Fifth, and then uh, a, a buddy of mine dragged me to uh, not dragged me, but he invited me to go to a, a show with him in uh, uh, November of nineteen seventy four. 
to see Genesis, which I'd heard a couple songs when I went there, and, and that was the uh, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway show, <clears throat> which, which just totally floored me, as I mentioned in a previous video. And that's how I got on a Genesis. I ran right out and bought the uh, uh, the album, The Land Lies Down on Broadway. Loved that album. And then I went back and started doing all my catch-up work subsequently. So it was in the latter part of 1974, uh, which was roughly two years after this came out where I first heard this album, maybe early 75. I don't remember the exact timeline of, of, of how I went back and did all my catch-up work with Genesis, but it was, it was late 74, early 75, a couple of years later, but you know, it, me and, and, uh, and a few million other, uh, Americans is <laughs> when we, when we got caught up to this record, right? Um, I did a ranking of of Genesis albums on at geezerology.com uh, on a blog a couple of years ago. And I ranked this number two. And and I struck when I was when I was writing that, I remember when I was writing that uh that piece, I was I was struggling. I was going back and forth between uh Foxtrot and the Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, whether I'd put number one or number two. And it was it was a close call for different reasons. I ended up putting uh, "Lamb Lies Down" on Broadway at number one, mostly for sentimental reasons, more than uh, actually uh, critical artistic reasons. Uh, <clears throat> probably if I took the sentimentality out of the way, I'm I'm I might put Foxtrot at, at number one. It, it was it probably probably artistically, I think is probably their uh, their best achievement. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, it's uh, an album that's definitely worth a listen, and uh, I can uh, endorse Scott's uh, recommendation of uh, careful uh, attention to, to Phil Collins, who I was astonished by his uh, his talent, and uh, I had really no idea that he was as skilled a drummer as he is. So uh, for that alone, it's worth uh, listening to. And uh, anyway, uh, you won't you won't regret the time that you you, you spend uh, giving it a, a good hear. Social security took care of this lad. We watch in reverence as narcissists is turned to a flower. A flower? <laughs> 